bullets. 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 <laughs> why do I always laugh? I don't know. Why I do you? I have no idea. I suppose because I'm saying hello on behalf of both of us, Toy and Robert, to all our chums out there. Your burning questions, a pile of useless answers, we are ready to serve. First though, I want to say thank you because this came through the post from YouTube today and it's an award for 100,000 subscribers, which apparently is quite unusual. Wow. So thank you to all of you and thank you to YouTube. The first question is one that we both love. It's from Joe Neeson. Have either of us played the Glasgow Apollo? I can't remember how many times I played it, but at least twice in 81, twice in 82, and probably once in 84. Such fond memories of the 15 foot high stage the tiny little stairway up to the stage and i had big hair back then and had to go up sideways you look right down on the audience then you look straight at the balcony and the balcony was just doing this literally moving about 18 inches undulating as people danced did you play yes king crimson played there four times however only once was it the glasgow apollo and that was in October 73. The earlier circumstances, twice in 1971, I think May and October, it was Green's Playhouse, and yes. also in March 1973, King Crimson played there and recorded, and the live track, We'll Let You Know, an improv from that show was released on the Starless and Bible Back album. But I remember the carpets, all the carpets in this 4,000 seat theatre had It's Great, It's Greens. Yeah. And Al Jolson sold out a weeks of shows there, I think in the 30s, and bought the owner of Rolls Royce in acknowledgement of that. May I go further? As someone from the South whose early work was eh, in the West Country and then in London, audiences begin in Birmingham, moving northwards. In the south, I had the feeling that audiences went out to have a bad time, particularly in London. Who are you? What do you think you're doing up there? But by the time you got to Glasgow, boy, that balcony was rocking. I'll put it differently, because for me, my audience are rocking right from the Isle, Isle of Wight, Southampton, Cornwall, right up until Aberdeen and Inverness. I think what it is, is London people get more choice. Therefore, they kind of consider what you're doing. I found Oxford upwards, the whole audience would be physically ecstatic and expressing themselves. In Oxford, I played the new Oxford Theatre in 81, and there were so many kind of blokes on the roof tearing the tiles up and coming down the theatre curtains and onto the stage. They were, they made holes in the roof of the theatre and were literally falling on the stage crying. But I, I experienced in Glasgow the utter warmth and then you go even further north to Inverness and boy, they're absolutely crazy. They have no inhibition whatsoever. It is like a measuring rod. As you go further north, the more energy the audience gives you. It's fantastic. Isn't that a lovely question? Yes, it's excellent. Such a nice memory. John Charlish, how balmy is it? How balmy is Toya? I'm as balmy as a summer night. Oh, that's very good, lovey. <laughs> How balmy am I? No, my wife is not balmy at all. My wife is about the most sensible person I've known. I'm a problem solver. But also, I wrote this down when I read your question, John. As balmy as I desire to be, I believe I'm in control of this body, this life, this present time. So what does that say about how I feel about present day perception of normality? I write the craziest things at one in the morning. So you don't think I'm balmy at all? No, I don't. 
Or rather, I think my baby is very sane and straightforward and deals with difficulties and problems that arise in the moment, in the present moment of them. I am such a problem solver that complete strangers, when we're allowed out, stop us in the street and ask me how to solve something. It's as if I've got an invisible sign on my head. I will solve your problems. I will solve your problems. John, thank you for that one. Anthony Garone, do you think of music like it's a language? Now, Anthony Garone is the man who has just written a book about to be published on failure to fracture. Anthony has spent 22 years failing to play fracture. Well, well I can understand that. Well, actually he's done a pretty good job. Uh, Anthony's failure is so well achieved in my book, it's a success. It's 11, it's 11 notes a second. I mean, even you're scared of playing it. Terrified? Well, about 10 notes a second, love you. Oh, is that all? Crazy. Well, well, look, Anthony's question, do you think of music like it's a language? My answer is no, I do not think of music uh, like it's a language. For me, music is a quality, a presence, a friend. And in order to enter our world, my world, it needs a language through which to speak and act. So music is a quality organized in sound and in time, and different cultures have their own ways of. I want to say something, music is a language. It is an interpretation of space and time. There we are. That takes language because language interprets the chaos. There you go, Anthony. Do you want to finish what you're saying? Uh, why, dear? Go on, have I ruined the moment? No, dear, not at all. You've just, as normal, been very sensible and direct. Well, you have three seconds to finish your question or I'm moving on. One. Music is a cup which holds the wine of silence. Music is a quality organised in sound and in time. And each culture organises the principles of presenting music into the world in a phenomenal aspect. This numinal quality according to its own standards. I knew you had something to say. Susan Bevan, if when one sad day you shake off your mortal coils, well, it's inevitable, you could live on with your avatars. Could, I think it should say, could we? It says you could live on. Well, whatever. Well, what's your answer? Uh, it won't be a sad day when I fly away. I'll be a happy boy. And would I wish to live on as an avatar? No, I'm on to the next gig. I don't want to be me forever, and I do believe in reincarnation, but what I would say is I'd like to live with my avatar now, because my avatar would be a good foot taller, would be drop dead sexy, would be really badly behaved and have no inhibitions whatsoever, would be the complete opposite of what I am. We'd be so polarized, we'd have a fantastic time. Kevin Tyler, if you were told you could not perform again unless you were anything but a human, oh, All right, so am I again. completely blind or is this just not making sense? Uh, if you were told you could not perform again unless you were anything but a human, that is, only an animal, a mineral or a form of vegetation, what would you choose to be? And Kevin says, please choose one for each category. So what animal, mineral or vegetational form would you adopt to perform music? A whale, aquamarine for mineral or topaz because that vibrates in the throat chakra or a Russian red cedar tree, which is believed to have all healing power. Well, Kevin, there's, there's too many questions in there for me. I'll take the first one. What animal form would I adopt? There are two animal forms, either of which I'm happy to address. One would be a uniclops. <laughs> that would be the offspring of a unicorn and a cyclops. I like it. And the other one would be a minocorn which would be the offspring of a minotaur and a unicorn. Well, there you go, Kevin. He hasn't answered your question, but you've got a great answer anyway. So just be pleased you got something from Master Fripp. Peter McStoneman, do you meditate? If so, how? And there is a second question attached. Do you guys do yoga? So let's put them together. Well, I'm not made to do yoga. I have shallow sockets, so I dislocate. Do you do yoga? Yes, I do yoga. And yes, I do have a, a meditation and sitting practice. 
Uh, I do have an interior architecture that informs, supports and directs my actions in life, but going into the details of it, I don't think are particularly relevant. The only way I can meditate is sitting outside in the silence of the world. And what I be mean by that is being outside with nature, because I find nature is, it is a language, it's telling us something the whole time. And the birds are just so breathtaking in how they show off and manipulate each other with their song. And you think, my goodness, they are doing that purely because they can. It's not always about attracting a mate or finding food or giving each other news. They are blatantly showing off. And when I sit outside and I hear this, it takes me away from me and I feel connected to this wonderful and extraordinary extraordinary earth energy but I do believe it's incredibly important to discover your higher self and meditation the way I think you both mean it Peter and Jed is something I can only do through movement movement for me releases enough endorphins for me to find a dialogue with my higher self and I look upon my higher self as the go-between between me in this physical body and the great creative whoever we choose to believe in does that make sense perfectly expressed sweetie okay thank you and that's a great question I think some people just can't meditate and I certainly can't do yoga I I'm just not made that way I bend in completely opposite directions to everyone else Connor Lemke, I'm a student learning about music. What tips do you guys have for writing music? Can I go first? Please. Treat every idea as if it has full potential, especially when you're starting out. Chip away at it, chip away. And each time you chip away and alter it, learn something about yourself and what your natural style is. And ask yourself, do I like what I'm doing? And this is how you develop your individual voice. It will teach you what works and what doesn't work and also when to stop because you have finished your writing. My advice would be to play. Have fun. It's, it's an easy mistake to make for someone who takes the musical work seriously to be serious about it. Well, that's when everything stops. So my suggestion would be to play, have fun without judgment. And while you're having fun and playing without judgment, without criticism, find a way of putting down these ideas, whether with a manuscript book or a recorder or a video or whatever, but primarily have fun and allow music to have fun with you. If you've got an iPhone, there's a voice app on the iPhone. Just always record everything you do. And if you start improvising, definitely record it. Because there's something about improvisation that is so magical and in the moment that you can bet your bottom dollar within five minutes you will have forgotten the sequence you've played. And also try and find a musical soulmate. I believe my musical soulmate is Simon Darling because we can just sit in an empty room and piece something together out of the ether like a jigsaw puzzle and we create something that is actually independent of both of our styles and that is such an honor and that is very enjoyable and creativity needs to be enjoyable when you're under pressure in your career or your older life and you're hitting deadlines that joy can go. So find the joy. We all deserve it. Carly Hildred, you ask, I was wondering if you two blended your names, what combo do you prefer? Well, will it Fripcox and our domestic unicorns behind us? Took one of these for each of them. So there's Willip on the right and Fripcox on the left. But giving this, giving this question a little thought this morning, I examined a few anagrams, and here's a couple of my <laughs> hyperbaric foxtrot pillow. I love it. And flirty April K-pop's blowtorch. My, my all-time favourite. <laughs> Mine is Toyert. There's also Fritcox, which we always call ourselves Fritcox. But also there's She Boss, He Mine. I like that. Very me. 
SM, if you could relive one day again, what would that day be? And it can't be when you both met. For me, it was seeing Bill for the last time and all three of us knew it was the last time, but obviously no one talked about the elephant in the room. And Bill was having his chemo, it was November 2019, and the taxi came to take us to the airport. I would like to go back to that day and complete the circle of our great bond in a way that says, this has been the privilege of knowing each other. God bless you, fly away. It was hard. And the other one would be the night before my father's stroke because he was so agitated because his best friend had a stroke the night before my father's stroke. And if I could go back, I would just calm him down and get him to a hospital because I think he gave himself a stroke. And if I could have stopped that, and no doubt we all think like this, I think he would have lived a bit longer. He was 89. And it's something I often think about. How about for you? Uh, for me, it would be the moment that I woke up in this body and I was a, a little baby in a pram, and I know that it was in Central Avenue, Corf Mullen, near Wimborne. And looking out through that little Fripp baby's eyes, there was a, a what I would now call an aeroplane flying overhead, and a, a thunderous sound as it went. And the Fripp baby became agitated by the sound and the experiencing Robert was sucked into the body and the concerns of the body. So this was my first ever conscious moment of seeing in this lifetime, in this body. And I would like to return to it to experience that primal, innocent experience, but now with a lifetime of experience. I remember I don't know how old I was, but it's got to be within the first year of my life. My mother changing my nappy, and I'm about to turn 63, so nappies were toweling, toweling triangles back then with what looked like huge safety pins. And I can remember my mother changing my nappy and deliberately waiting, holding on to a number two. I think, I think our chums out there, lovey. And evacuating the whole of my body in the fresh nappy as soon as she did the safety pin up and thus was my nature revealed <laughs> i remember how angry she was um tolga gazalu do you think William Blake is the greatest English poet or is there another poet? Now, we answered this last week, but I didn't let you get your answer. We didn't in. have time for you to put an answer in. Well, first of all, Blake, well, the greatest, certainly one of the greatest. Uh, he, who binds, he who binds to himself a joy doth the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. This is entirely practical advice about the assumption of innocence within a context of experience, which moves us to the second, the greatest poet in the English language, William Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. Hamlet, assume a virtue if ye have it not. Once again, the assumption of virtue. Now, we don't really know very much about these characters' backgrounds, not really, 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 particularly Shakespeare, but these are very, very practical pieces of advice for the aspirant artist. Not quite in the same league, but nevertheless in his time considered the greatest poet and of interest to me because he was a Dorset man. Ah! Oh. Thomas Hardy. He wasn't really very well liked in in Dorchester, and he did live in Wimborne in about 81, 1881. Why was he not like? Was he a bit like Turner and a bit of a anti-social human being? He wasn't. Chuckles Hardy was not the nickname given to oh, him. Oh, okay. And Neutral Tones is my favourite Hardy poem, and it's so Hardy. Neutral Tones. 
We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as though chidden of God. Thanks, Thomas. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> no, Chuckles Hardy, not. Wow. Yeah. But that, that is so reflective of the period. No, it's so reflective of Hardy loving. Okay, well, well, talking of reflections, what's the magic chord today? Well, I, 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 no magic here, but following on from last week. Oh, I, I may need to turn up a little, dear. Excuse me, chums. So we were looking at this. And I thought, in terms of developing variations and how we move towards extemporization. So if we take this figure. Line, then backwards, bollocks, and then perhaps bollocks. So we've moved from five to four. Very good. No, it's not particularly magical, but it might interest a few of... Well, I enjoyed having bollocks shouted in my ear from a very close proximity. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for lending us your ears. We wish you love, health, luck and happiness. We will be back tomorrow for Sunday lunch. Play out music. Bollocks! <laughs> this really is a crock of... <laughs> bollocks! Look, no play out music, just look. Lots of lots of love here from Robert. And name Joy of your wife. <laughs> yeah. Bollocks. This really is a crock of <laughs> Bollocks. <laughs>